Hi, here on the workbench today is yet another LCR meter. This time it is an East Tester ET431. It was provided to me by Banggood. I will provide a link in the video description below for those who are interested in getting one after watching this video. East Tester seems to have a lot of products, and if you recall, I reviewed an ET5410A Plus electronic load a few weeks ago. Even though that one was from Must Tool, not from East Tester, but it was likely just rebranded as the model name is a dead giveaway. Anyway, I was pretty happy with the quality of the electronic load, so I was going through Banggood's website and found that they also carry this LCR meter from East Tester, and therefore I was eager to find out how well the ET430 series are made. In my opinion, anyone who is serious in electronics should have a proper LCR meter at some point. Of course, for casual projects, you can probably just get by with a cheap eBay component tester like this one. And if you only need capacitance measurements and don't need inductance measurements, you can probably also scrape by with just a multimeter, as the majority of multimeters nowadays, even cheap ones, can also measure capacitance. But none of those options are proper replacements for an LCR meter. The reason is that an LCR meter gives you the precise conditions under which the components are measured. And this is critical for designs, such as switching power supplies. Anyway, here is a brief comparison of the different models in the ET430 series. They differ mainly in the supported testing frequencies and bias voltages. I specifically requested the 431 model, and the reason is, as you can see, it supports pretty much all the features the ET430 series offer, and its price is very attractive at under $160. Of course, if you do need test frequencies up to 100 kHz and need the continuous frequency and bias voltage adjustments rather than just at a few fixed points, you will need to get the ET433, but it comes at almost double the price of the ET431. So in my opinion, the ET431 gives the most bang for your buck. Another benefit of the ET431 model and above is that they include these Kelvin clips which can come in very handy if you need to do precise four terminal measurements. Besides the Kelvin clips, you also get these standard leads, and the quality of these are actually quite good. You also get a charger and a mini USB cable for charging and PC connection. And yes, this is a little bit old school here. Instead of USB-C or even a micro USB, it is a mini USB instead. Not a big deal for me personally, but uh, the manufacturer probably should consider a mid-cycle refresh at some point, as the standards have shifted over the years. Alright, time for me to power it on. And as you can see, it powered on really quickly. If you have used any LCR meters before, you will have no problem getting around this one. The main functionalities are very intuitive and some of the functions can be achieved via multiple ways. For example, right now we're at the frequency setting, you can see here. Let me just zoom it in a little bit. And currently it's at 1 kilohertz. So to change the frequency, all you do is you can just press the frequency button and it will cycle through the different frequencies available. Or you could alternatively use the up and down arrow to change the frequency here. So very intuitive indeed. There are also a few buttons with secondary functions. The secondary functions are marked underneath, as you can see here, the cal, the record, and also the DCR here, and compare. So these four buttons can be multiplexed between different functions. And to get to the secondary function, you simply just long press the button. We'll take a look at some of these functions later on. Now let's do some measurements. To achieve accurate results, you really need to understand what each of the settings mean. I have seen people complaining about their LCR meters giving erroneous results, not because the meter is broken, but because the parameter settings are incorrect. One of the important settings is the series mode versus parallel mode. And as a rule of thumb, series mode is for low impedance measurements, such as measuring small resistance, small inductance, and large capacitance. Whereas parallel mode is for high impedance measurements, such as large resistance, large inductance, and small capacitance. The recommended settings are usually buried in the user manual, but you can definitely find them there if you need to verify. So let's take a look at the impedance measurements first. In this measurement mode, you can measure up to 20 mega ohms. 
The accuracy depends on the measurement range and frequency, and you can refer to the spec and figure out the exact accuracy specification for your intended measurements. As I just mentioned a moment ago, that the settings are extremely important. You can see right now we're at 1 kHz and uh, we are in series measurement mode. We're not connecting anything yet, but we are nevertheless measuring some 700, 800 odd kilo ohms. This is actually quite normal, as the series measurement mode is geared towards small resistance measurements. And right now the measurement frequency is set at 1 kHz. If I lower the frequency, you will see this value actually will increase. So that's just some typical behavior of a LCR meter. And now we're at 100 Hz. That should be good for our demonstration purpose. And here I have a 1 kilo ohm resistor. So let's take a quick look here. And you can see that we get a 980 ohms, which is uh, pretty much in the ballpark of what this resistor's true value is. And let's take a look at a 100 ohm resistor. And this is not a precision resistor, so we just kind of uh, take a quick look. At least it's in the ballpark, we should be good. And indeed, we're measuring 98.7 ohms, so that's close enough. On the ET431 and above, you'll also have this DCR mode, or direct current resistance mode. And as the name suggests, in this mode, resistance is measured using DC signal instead of AC signal that is commonly found in a typical LCR meter. For most of the resistors, unless the AC characteristics are specified, your best bet is to use this DCR mode to get the most accurate result. And we can demonstrate it here. Of course, the supplied Kelvin clips would be very convenient in this case. So let me just swap it out. Now, the Kelvin clips technically is a 5-wire measurement, as it also has a guard terminal. The guard terminal is important for high impedance measurements as it cancels out the errors caused by leakage. So for this demonstration, I'm going to measure a 100 ohm precision resistor. This one has a precision of 0.1%. And before we do that, let's uh, rail out the measurement here. So it's uh, pretty good already. Let me just leave it as is. And uh, let's uh, measure the resistance here. And you can see we're actually not measuring 100 ohm. We're measuring 100.27. So you may be wondering what is going on here. As we have this precision resistor, it should be 100 ohm pretty much bang on, but we're showing some discrepancy here. As mentioned earlier, since we don't have the spec for AC characteristics for this resistor, so we better just measure it under DC instead. So let me press and hold frequency. And now we're in DCR mode, and it will take some time for the measurement to be made. And you can see now, once the measurement is made, we are reading 100.0301 ohm. And that is definitely within the spec. And of course, just to verify, let's uh, zero it out, just to make sure we don't have any residual reading here. Again, it will take quite a few seconds for the reading to stabilize. Yeah, as you can see, we're only 0 0.005 ohm out. So clearly the reading is definitely within that 0.1% tolerance. So that is a quick demonstration of that direct current resistance measurement mode. And by the way, you can change the speed of measurements by pressing the speed button. And we have three ranges, medium, fast, and slow. Slow takes longer, but it gives you more accurate results and fast averages less, so the result will jump around quite a bit more. And for me, I prefer accurate measurement than speed, so let me change it back to slow. Also, I forgot to mention, there are some system settings you can adjust via this set button. You can see we have quite a few parameters you can change. And one value you probably want to tinker around is the power on set. Currently, it is at default value, which means every time you power it off, when you power it back on again, the settings are restored to the default. 
But if you don't like that, you can change it to the last value, which will essentially be the last state prior to powering off. All right, so now we can take a look at the capacitance measurement mode. Let me switch out of the DCR mode. And just to let you see the effect of a different speed, again, I'm going to do it here. You can see medium, fast. Actually, the fast is quite fast. You can see that we're updating about maybe three times a second. That's definitely sufficient. But anyway, as I mentioned earlier, I prefer to keep it as slow as that gives us the best results here. OK, now let's take a look at the capacitance measurement mode. And in this mode, you can measure capacitance up to 20 millifarads. Again, the accuracy is range and frequency dependent. So let me start with a few smaller capacitors. Remember, for smaller capacitors, we need to use the parallel mode. So let's change it to parallel. And let's null it out. So the first one I'm going to measure is a 22 picofarad capacitor here. So let's do that. You can see we get a very stable reading of 25.3 picofarads. And by the way, the resolution is actually frequency dependent. Right now we're setting the frequency at 1 kilohertz. So if we put a frequency a little bit higher, we can actually get one extra digit. So now we're measuring 24.8, roughly, picofarads. Again, remember the actual measurement result is frequency dependent. And by the way, while you're doing the measurement, you can also change the AC signal applied across the device under test. So right now we're supplying a 600 millivolts signal, and we can change that. So let's see, we want it to one volt. You can see that again. It probably affects your measurement ever so slightly. Nevertheless, you have the choice of 600 millivolts, 300 millivolts, 100 millivolts, and one volt. That is for the ET431. And for ET433, you actually have a continuous range of the level that you can use to measure your components. So let's change it back to 600 millivolts. And let's measure another capacitor here. So I'm going to swap it out. So this one is, uh, by the look of it, is a 100 nanofarad capacitor. And uh, let's change the frequency to see if we get a better reading here. The readings we're seeing here does appear to be a little bit lower. So let me just verify that with my Agilent U1731B. And you can see that there is a little bit of variation, but nevertheless, it's around 77, 78 nanofarads, which is pretty close to what we're measuring on this ET431. And you saw we had some discrepancy between what is measured on the ET431 versus what is on the U1731B. That measurement, again, is dependent on the voltage level you used and also the frequency and everything else. So, for example, right now, I reduced the voltage to 100 millivolts, and you can see the measured capacitance is actually a little bit lower. But if I increase it, let's say, to 1 volt, you can see that the measured capacitance actually is a little bit higher, and that is actually quite normal. So let me set it back to 600 millivolts. This meter also has a dedicated function for electrolytic capacitor measurement. And the reason is polarity. Although you can measure electrolytic capacitor with a very small AC signal, say 0.3 volts, it nevertheless will be more accurate if you bias the capacitor with a correct polarity. And that's exactly what this meter does. So let's take a look at here. And if you see, we have this uh, capacitor symbol here, and this is actually for electrolytic capacitor measurement. So if we just press it, you will see that, let me just zoom it in here. You'll see here, the level is set to 300 millivolts, and the bias is at 500 millivolts. 
So basically at no time would the polarity across the capacitor actually change because the bias is higher than the AC signal superimposed onto the test signal. So that prevents you reversely bias the electrolytic capacitor. So let's measure a one millifarad capacitor here. You can see this is a 10 volts, 1000 microfarad capacitor. So let's change the frequency to say 100 Hertz. And let's do it. And as you can see, we're measuring one millifarad. While we're at it, we can also see its ESR. Now, here we're displaying the dissipation factor, but we can easily swap to ESR. And you can see it's a 100 milliohm. That is pretty good for this 1000 microfarad capacitor. Now, let's uh, measure a larger capacitor. This one is at 15,000 microfarads. So let's see if we can measure this. And you see we're measuring about 13 millifarads, and that's a little bit off. But again, the measurement, remember, is dependent on the frequency and everything else. So for example, if we change the frequency, I bet you will see a slightly different reading here. So let's change it to 1 kilohertz. Yeah, you can see that the reading actually went up. So again, this is highly dependent on the frequency that we're measuring. So let's change it back to 100 hertz. And of course, you can always just measure the capacitance using the standard LCR mode. So we can demonstrate that as well. So now I'm switching it to the standard LCR mode. So basically, there's no more bias. Let's take a look. And you can see here in this mode, we are getting a pretty comparable result. And as we mentioned earlier, the series and parallel are kind of important. So right now we're measuring this in series mode as it's a very low impedance here. But let's just say we switch it to parallel mode. Let's see what results we get. And you can see that the measurement is significantly lower than what we got from the series measurement. So let's go to series again. It doesn't differ by that much, but nevertheless, you can see there's a slight difference in the measured results. So here is parallel. You can see that we're measuring 12 something. And when we go back to a series, we're measuring 13 something. So just something to pay attention to. All right, now let's take a look at the inductance measurement mode. So for that, I'm going to switch it to inductance. And I'm going to measure, let's see, uh, using the frequency of 1, let's do 10 kilohertz, because I'm going to measure a very small inductor. This one is about 220 microhenry. So let's take a look. And you can see that, no problem, we're reading 217, 218 microhenry. Because of the inductance is low, we're using the series mode. You can see that. So let's uh, switch to parallel mode and just to see if we see any difference here. And you can see that parallel mode measures slightly higher, but this is not that significant. All right, that's pretty much all I want to demonstrate with this meter. Now it's time for us to turn it off and open it up. The stand is actually interesting. It's not integrated as part of the case, but rather it is part of this rubber holster. You can see here, this fits right in here. That is actually different than a lot of the meters I have seen. But anyway.
All right, so I open it up and I don't think I needed to remove this board actually out from the case because as you can see, there's nothing underneath here. This is the LCD here. And if I look at it, we have two of these connectors here. One is unused. So I'm assuming either they are for different models or something of that nature. So there's not too much to see here. And here is our keypad that is on the front side. And you can see on this PCB, there's nothing on this end. So I'm going to put it back and we can concentrate on the other side. The unit is powered by this LiPo battery pack. And by the look of it, it's a 3.7 volts, 3 amp hour battery pack here. Also some good news here. If you look at the case here, you will see that the USB port is on the side of the case and it's actually mounted on the separate riser board. So in theory, you could swap it out for a different USB port if you really want to. And uh, as long as you have this connector, and I think the connector is fairly standard, you have two power and uh, two data wire. So that is pretty straightforward if you wanted to swap out the USB port. I also like the modular design of the circuit boards here. You can see we have this riser board that is actually pressed onto the main board here via these two headers. And uh, this is our input section, which is nice and neat. One thing strikes me a little bit is the silk screen on this board. You can see it is ET43M V1. That indicates that it is not specific to the ET431 that we're reviewing here. And if you look around the board, you will see that actually nothing is missing on this board. So this could mean that the hardware is essentially the same for all the ET430 series, and the only differences lie in the software itself. And of course, that's just my speculation at this point. If you know it for sure, please leave a comment in the comment section below. And just by looking at the board layout, you can see that everything is laid out very neatly. There's no botched wire, no botched components, and everything is very clean. The large component here, that's our microprocessor. It is an APM32F103, which is an ARM Cortex-M3 microprocessor. It's actually quite a beefy processor here. These Cortex-M3 ARM processors are pretty much the standard in these handheld devices nowadays. And towards the left, you can see we have a programming header, and one is probably a communication header, not entirely sure. Towards the bottom here, you can see we have this uh, four-pin connector, that's for the USB. And uh, this section probably contains a charging controller, just my guess, as we do have the USB charging capability here. And because most of the functionality is implemented in this microprocessor, the remaining circuitry is actually, there's not too much to it. You can see here. In this section of the circuit, we have a MOX in the middle here, and we have two of these high-speed op amps. These are AD8052. These are real-to-real -real operational amplifiers and have a unit gain of 110 megahertz. Besides the high-speed op amp, we also have two of these general-purpose op amps, these are COS722. And if you look around the board, you will see that we have quite a few of these smaller components. These are SGM3002, single pole double throw electronic analog switches. And up here, we have a, by the look of it, a poly fuse and some protection dials here. And that's pretty much everything that is on this circuit board. And that's pretty much all I want to cover in this video. In my opinion, the ET431 is a decent LCR meter. Let me know what you think in the comment section below. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you liked the video, please don't forget to give it a big thumbs up and remember to subscribe to the channel for more videos like this in the future. I will catch up with you next time.